Uh, thanks everyone for being here tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, thanks so much for being here tonight, everyone. Um, as you know, the show is broadcast live every Thursday on LiveSciFi.tv. Um, I would appreciate anybody to um, send me comments or send us comments on the show. Uh, give us a like. And uh, if there's any uh, shows that you would like us to present to you, please, please make some comments about the show. And if you would subscribe, then um, you will get all the show alerts for um, the Do You Believe show. So again, thanks so much, everybody, for being here. I see everybody in chat. Thank you once again. And the show is going to start in a few seconds. Thank you. Welcome everybody to Do You Believe? And my guest tonight is Jason Telto, who is an expert on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, Jason, thanks so much for joining me tonight in the show. Well, thank you so much for having me today. And um, I know I have an expert with me on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, how did you get involved in this? Uh, well, growing up in Texas, you know, it was kind of an urban legend, the whole situation that, you know, did this really happen? And, you know, as a kid, that's just fascinating to think that, you know, there was some guy in Texas that had a, a chainsaw in Texas. Uh, and then once you really get into the actual story of it, you realize, hey, it didn't even happen here. And uh, it, was just, it, it was one of those things that, it, I guess it was, you know, Texas seems like a different country to so many people. It was our urban legend, I guess you'd say. Are you from Texas? Awesome. All right. So now I have a question to ask you: Is the Texas is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre real? The idea behind it is real. There was a man uh, by the name of Ed Dean who lived in Wisconsin, though Plainfield, Wisconsin. Population is six hundred and thirty-two. Uh, as for the movie itself, uh, there were some some liberties taken with it, of course, uh, but. The man, as you see, Ed Dean right here, um, he was born in 1906 to George and Augusta. Now, George, of course, was a drunkard. He was very violent with his children. And Augusta hated her husband that, with a passion, but because of her religious beliefs, she could never get a divorce from him. Uh, and so they, you know, they beat their children and... and they beat and, them? And, and, they did. They beat them. Uh, Augusta wouldn't allow them to have friends. They would have to go to school and come directly home afterwards. She verbally abused and, them as well, too, didn't she? Yes. Oh, yeah. Very bad. Poor things. So, go ahead. Um, well, basically, you know, and um, in, I believe it was around, oh, let me see if I can get this correct, I believe it was 1940, Somebody may correct me, 44, no, yeah, it was 40. Um, George had died, the, the dad had died of a heart attack. Right, it was 1940. And they were living in La Crosse, Plainfield at this time. Well, after he had died, uh, that's the bottom little store and moved everybody to Plainfield to the farmhouse that is now, you know, the legendary uh, death house. Right, but that house burnt down, but we'll talk about that later. seems to pop up again. 
in it again where they relate sex to violence and so that's when you start getting this mentality that Ed had of you know women to him were more or less a thing and uh, you know because of his mother's religious beliefs well he had a fetish too um I, and I'm not sure where he got all this from. I don't know if he he started getting these these weird things happening to him, or was it after his mother died that he became obsessed with body parts and stuff? That was after uh, she had died. But see, in, in 44, his brother Henry uh, mysteriously died in a fire, supposedly, because he went out to burn off the backfield. Well... Reports have come in. If you read a, a book called uh, Deviant, I believe it is, yeah, uh, which is a good read if anybody gets a chance, um, it says that he was found with bruises upon his head. That is the only place I've ever seen where that actually said that. Uh, other people said it was a heart attack. Either way, later on it was coming to find out that apparently Henry was killed by Ed in this field while they were burning off the brush. But he was never accused of Henry's death. Didn't they, right. didn't they say he uh, died of suffocation? Yeah, that's, that's the official, until after later on, you know, when Ed was finally arrested, that part kind of came to light. But so after Henry had died, uh, Henry was kind of Augustus' favorite in a way, you know, but he had turned from Augusta earlier to where, you know, oh, well, my mom's crazy, you know, and he's kind of going off on his own. So when he finally died, that's when Ed and Augusta's uh, relationship really started to falter. And uh, he was getting closer and closer to his mother, and she was pulling further and further away from him. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. And so, yeah, and so that that started to bother him immensely, because now, you know, he's looking for this connection with his mother, and she's pretty much given up on life at this point because her favorite son had died. Oh, and was so she was attached. Later that she had passed on. Okay, so she was attached to Henry. Right. Oh. Now, um, uh, I, I, I read that uh, he really had a hard time in school, that he couldn't make friends and, and the kids would make fun of him because he was effeminate and shy. There was that, uh, he was feminine, he was shy, he also had a small growth that was growing over his eye, which a lot of boys also make fun of, but even with all that, he still did really well in school. I get yeah. there. Right, right, go ahead. And, um, but once again, you know, she would make him come directly home from school, so even if he could have friends, nobody wanted to be his friend anyway, because he was just so shy and so yeah. held into himself because of his upbringing. Right, right. So he remained on the farm after she died. Mm-hmm. At that point, he completely boarded up every room except for the kitchen and another small room that was connected to the kitchen. And that's when it all started to really go wrong. Uh, between 1947 and 52, he started to um, dig up bodies from graveyards. Okay, now, f- now he, okay, let's step yeah. back a little bit. Let's go back a little bit. Um, okay. During the late 1940s and 50s, people started uh, disappearing in the town. Um, so that, there was, okay, there was one woman uh, in 1944, uh, 54. Well, that's the uh, one. Okay, okay, let me, let me go back a little bit. Um, this is what I got the information on. Uh, during the late 1940s, if you don't mind, Jason, me t- saying yeah, okay. this. Okay, during the late 1940s and 50s, um, people started disappearing. There were four cases in particular that baffled the police. There was an eight-year-old girl named Georgia Wickler who had disappeared coming home from school in 1947. Um, then there was another uh, girl disappeared six years later in La Crosse, Wisconsin. She was 15 years old, and her name was Evelyn Hartley, and she had been babysitting at the time she had vanished. Um, then there was um, t- 
two fellas um, in 1952, two men that stopped for a drink at a bar in Plainfield, Wisconsin, before heading out to a deer hunt, and they also disappeared. And um, and then and then so and then it went into 1954 with Mary Hogan. Now, with, with those instances, Ed, after he was captured, uh, never held back anything that he did. He, he went ahead and just, you know, let it all hang, and he never admitted to actually uh, having any involvement in those disappearances, though. So whether it was or wasn't him is still up for debate. Like, well, they never found the bodies. Right. Yeah. So, um, then in, um... 1954. Now, okay, now again, let's go back to, uh, when did he start, uh, did he start robbing the graveyard before he killed um, Mary Hogan, or did this lead up to it? Did he do his killings, and then he started um, uh, going into the graves? Well, it depends on, on where you hear. I've heard both stories. I've heard that he started and this is my personal belief, too, from what I've read. Uh, he started with grave robbing, uh, and then eventually that became not enough for him that eventually he killed. And now I've also seen other websites, I think maybe Wikipedia even may have said, that he started to uh, uh, kill first in 1954. And I, I don't believe that. I think that, yeah, he started with the grave robbing, uh, and then eventually, it, it just wasn't up. He, because, okay, to get into his head, you have to understand, it, it, of course, a lot of people have seen Psycho. Yeah. Now, the Norman, hmm? go ahead. Which, of course, the Norman Bates character is also um, based on it. And that is a good, another view of him as in the personal relationship he had. Where after she was dead, uh, he still talked to her, and she would talk back to him in his head. And um, so he was trying to have this relationship with her, you know, after she was gone. And so what he started to do by digging up the graves is he would take certain body parts, and it's usually female, and he would, of course, make, he made this suit. And at night, he would put this suit on, and that was when he was his mother. Right, he wanted to be a female. So he and right. so actually he wanted to be his mother. Well, it was it was what uh, it's not necessarily be his mother, but it was a way he could feel closer to him to her. I guess by being like her as a woman in in sorts, you know. Um, he didn't necessarily want to be her, but he wanted to to have that relationship. And it's the same mentality of cannibalism with serial killers is. They want to be so close to the victims, they almost have to take in their their body into their own body to make it that much more real to them. Now, and so, uh, do you see the picture that I have of the bodysuit? Yeah, that's that's the real bodysuit, isn't it? That they took. Yes. Okay. Um, and it would because the one I'm seeing right now is just the the chest plate and the mask. He also had you know the full. I think he had another picture where it had from the movie, where he had yeah. pants to, and he also had belts and, and neckties and, and wardrobe to go with the clothing. So it was kind of like he would put on the body and then he would put on clothes made of the human skin as well. Right, right. So, okay, go ahead. Um, I'm just curious. I, I couldn't get the correlation between, okay, so he dug up the graves for the body parts. Now, was he using um, this this the skin off of these bodies? Because he dug up fresh fresh graves, right? They were newly um, dug graves yeah. to get these bodies where the skin was still intact on the body. So right. so he used that skin to um, to make like lampshades and and other things with the, with the skin. Yes, he made. Uh, there was when the police finally found there were human skin lampshades. There was, his bowls were made out of human skulls. He had a pair of lips as the cord on his blinds to the window. Oh my God. He had um, a pair of socks that were made out of human feet. Oh my God, I couldn't get any of those pictures. 
Now, what about that mask that he made? Where did that come from? That was um, one of the, they never released the actual, because he had many of them. He had many faces hanging on the wall, but he also had Mary Hogan's face, now depending on the reports. One was in the refrigerator, another one was her face was in a bag. And that was basically the last one he was known to wear. So this this picture of this mask that I have, um, was this the one that he would put over his own face? Yes. Okay, but they don't know whose whose face that was. Uh, no, not, not not all of them. They couldn't all be accounted for because some of them were already just rotted away so bad they they couldn't you know they didn't have any teeth for dental records or anything like it was just the face. Oh. Uh, but there was they know that throughout the house at the time there was anywhere from thirteen to sixteen bodies they knew were in the house aside from Mary Hogan and Bernice Morton because he, the, the ones that he admitted to actually killing he only admitted to killing two people and that was them oh, everybody right. else was already dead prior to him just picking them up and using their flesh right and mm -hmm. there you have a picture of the gloves, the gloves he made yes. and he would walk around in the moonlight wearing those as well oh my god now um his the victim, the one of the victims that he admitted killing to was Mary Hogan, and she was a tavern owner. And um, now he shot, now these two victims that he had, he shot both of them. Uh, yes. Yes, he used a, what, twenty two caliber to, to kill both of them? Which what? I was surprised that that's how he killed them. Yeah, it, and the, the, the one thing about Mary Hogan that you have to understand is he, you know, he, he frequented this bar, and he talked to her a lot. You know, they were basically friends. And the reason he liked her so much and chose her as his first live victim was she reminded him of his mother. Yeah, that's what I read, that he, he wanted victims that looked like his mother. Now, the thing about it is, um, uh, uh, the other one, Bernice, she didn't, I, didn't think she, I didn't think she looked like his mother, but I have no pictures of the parents. I wasn't able to get pictures of the parents. Right. Basically, what I've come to get discerned about what Augusta looked like physically, um, I think, A, she was a little heavier set, uh, but the main thing that was really connected to him was their attitudes. They were really free-spirited, which was exactly the opposite of his mother. So they kind of looked like his mother uh, in the features, but were complete opposite uh, mentally. And I think that kind of allowed him to reach into his inner demon and allowed him to say, oh, my mother was right about them. Well, look at her. She, you know, she's a prostitute. Look at how she's acting, you know, speaking of Mary. Because there were cases that, you know, she'd flirt for tips. And so he'd be sitting there quietly at the bar. He was a really quiet guy, still mm -hmm. shining his older years. And would be sitting there seeing her flirt with these guys get tips. And... To him, that just validated his mother's opinion of women. Oh, gotcha. Now, now Bernice was the other victim that he admitted to killing. Now, why did he kill her? Basically, it was a she was a victim of circumstance. He had gone into her store to buy antifreeze, which is also going to be his downfall. But we'll get back to that later. Uh, and. It was like hardly anybody was around at this time. He was the only one in the store. It was just him and Bernice. And so he was just standing there, you know, and his mother started to talk to him. You know, you need to kill this woman. She oh, my one. God. She the other. And so he asked, you know, hey, can I see that gun that was for sale? Because he wanted to go deer hunting or whatever. And so, you know, knowing Ed for years that she had, she handed the gun over, you know, take a look at it, and um, he happened to have a shell that he put in it and shot her right there on the spot oh. because his mother told her to. Now, 
Um, I don't know. I did. I couldn't read anywhere what he had done to um, Mary Hogan. Um, I do know that there was a, a body that was found. I'm not sure. See the body I'm showing now. I'm not sure if that was her or not, or just one of the bodies that happened to be in his house. Because it didn't say what he did to her, but I'm assuming he skinned her and decapitated her and, and everything else that he did with all the other bodies. Right, he did. That one that you have right there, I believe, yeah, there's a, it's a little, a little fuzzy here, but I, it's still got the head. That one, I believe, was just a body. Uh, because, yeah, Mary Hogan was decapitated and uh, her, her skull was being used as a bowl. And her face, like I said, was... Either in the fridge or the bag, one of the two. No, he also uh, had a fetish with shrunken heads. He did, because he had a friend who would send him books, because apparently he lived somewhere in the Amazon or whatever, you know, and would send him these uh, death magazines and these, you know, detective stories. And he got fascinated with Nazis. He got fascinated with headhunters and all this. And so he, that right there is actually, I believe, Mary Hogan. Oh, God. Know? That's her head? Yes, that was her face. Oh, and my. And so she head, and I see that every once in a while, but that was actually a full-size head. Okay, let's... That was her. Let's go back to Bernice, because what he, he did to her um, was like what you would do to a deer. Now, did he... Deer. Was there any information on him going deer hunting at all? Uh, yeah, because even the fact that they... The whole family was so secluded and really didn't want to have anything to do with the outside world. You know, they farmed, they got their own food, and the Wisconsin area is really ripe with deer. And so, you know, he grew up seeing his father gut deer exactly as he did Bernice. And so after he killed her in the store and drug her out, uh, he put her in a truck and took her and, you know, went straight to the barn and did that to her. He strung her up and, and got her out like a deer. Yeah. And that's where he, he made his downfall because the, Bernice's son had come into the store and saw the blood, so he knew something had happened. Well, he just happened to look at the registry to see who the last person in there was, and eight pints of antifreeze were sold to Ed Dean. And so, and you got to understand, at this point, he'd already been kind of, sus people were suspicious of him because, you know, he was quiet, and there were children that would come to his house and hang out and see this stuff, right. you know, see the shrunken heads. And he would say, well, you know, my, my cousin or whoever sent them to me from, you know, across the ocean, you know, and so they, they I'm sure those kids went back and told their parents. Oh, you know, I'm sure they did, but I don't think know, the parents believed he had shrunken heads. I, so he was already going to be a suspect. I don't think the parents believed the kids, though. I think it was so bizarre that they didn't believe him. And then there was, like, Bernice's son, uh, he knew, as soon as he saw that, he's like, because he always, you know, when he see Ed come into town, he always kind of had that look on his eye, like, yeah, he's up to something. But, you know, he could just be a quiet guy, but as soon as he saw, you know, the blood and everything, he knew it was Ed, and so he called the cops, and it, it, it took a little while to actually get the cops out there originally, because they were, like what you were saying, you know, people had heard the stories, but like, well, whatever, whatever. But when they finally went out there, they went into the barn, and that's where they saw Bernice. Now, um, in 1954, when Mary Hogan uh, disappeared, um, did they tie that into, um, into, into, into Ed? That was nothing that, there was a sheriff that never really liked Ed anyway, and he kept, uh, kept on his name when, when, you know, well, who could have done this? He'd bring Ed's name up. But everybody else was basically friends of it because it was such a small community. And in communities like that back in the 50s, you know, everybody tried to be each other's friend. Uh -huh. But he, um, I just lost track of Fox. Oh, but there was one sheriff that kept bringing his name up, but nobody really wanted to believe it, I guess. And so he was never officially tied into Mary Hogan until they actually found her remains. Okay, so then, um, and then, and then the murder of Bernice Warden, and that was in 1957. Yes. Um, so what finally happened? Um, how did they finally catch him? Okay, well, like I said, when, when 
Narisa's son saw me with Russ when he called the sheriff. They came out, and they were just horrified by what they saw because they first went to the house. Now, I think one of the movies that shows them going to the barn first, and that's just not what happened. They went in the house and were just, you know, horrified by what they, I mean, from just littered with body parts. And, I mean, you've got to imagine a house with all the furnishings you would have they're just made out of human body parts. I mean, it, it's it's inconceivable how horrible it must be until he eventually went out to the barn and finally saw Mary Hogan to, I mean, uh, excuse me, Bernice Warden, and tied it all together that this is where they were all going. This is this answers the questions of the Grey Rock, and this answers the questions for Mary Hogan and Bernice Warden. Mm -hmm. So they finally, you know, they took him to jail, and he was, you know, very willing to go. He didn't fight. He didn't do anything. Well, they but didn't they sure. find them. They found him. Uh, I read that they found him in the in the store. He went, he did go back to the store. Did he? I think there was. There's well, once again, the stories on Evan. They're so varied because there's so many people that put in the the legend as opposed to just the facts. And I wish they could leave just facts, but supposedly he went back to clean up his mess because he was originally going to do it, but people started coming around. And so he wanted to get the body in the truck and get her home first. And then he came back afterwards to kind of clean up his mess. And he was really just relaxing, too, because I believe he was also planning on going to the bar afterwards. Um. Now, of course, different uh, waitress after so many years later, but... Um, now, um, I did get a picture of the um the one of the rooms that he didn't touch because he left the upstairs as a shrine to his mother and i happen to be exactly. showing that uh, the one decent room um i guess that the uh, photographers took of the one cleaned room so then um they came in and i guess they started uh rummaging um um the crime lab started came in and they started looking for any evidence that they had on uh, on what he was doing? Right, they came in and, and they, they found anywhere from 13 to 16 uh, bodies other than the, the two live victims being Mary and Bernice. And it, it took them a long time to do everything and, and write it all down because there was just so much stuff in this house. Uh, he was a pack rat along with the body parts, so it was just just tons and tons of stuff. Oh, I mean. They had to go through every little bit because you didn't know where he had stuff because, I mean, they went through a big pile of stuff under his bed and that's where they pulled out a shoebox full of bullets and nipples and nose. He had a box of noses. You know, there was just stuff stashed everywhere in the house. Oh, my God. What was he doing with all that stuff? He was just collect He was a collector, basically. You know, some of it he would use to make his, you know, things, his outfits or his clothes or his furniture, and others he would just collect. And he, he strangely enough, had an affection for female sex organs, that those he would do one of two things, either collected them or he ate them. Oh, but my he God. Was he a cannibal as well? He, he was. He <sighs> did eat um, some of his victim stuff. Now... Once again, there are different, like, there was said that there was body parts in the refrigerator and there was a heart on the stove ready to be cooked. Now, <laughs> once again, that could be legend because who would just leave a heart in a pan? Oh, You know, he's like, not even the house, of course. But, so, you know, with something as horrific as this, people almost make it legend just so they can deal with the atrocity, you know? It's so hard for us to wrap our mind around. There are people in the world like this doing this. I mean, he had a Christmas tree that had ornaments of male testicles. Oh my like why, God. Why, how can you even imagine something like that? Oh my it was just God. So far gone. Wow. So then um, they, they uh, arrested him, but they found him mentally incompetent. They did. Now, one thing that sheriff I was telling you about that didn't like him, uh, he actually, when he was interrogating Ed, uh, slammed Ed around, banged his face 
into a brick wall, uh, really messed him up good. And so the first um, confession he gave was deemed inadmissible in court because of how it was obtained. Oh my God. So that had a lot to do with the fact that he wasn't found, you know, guilty of these charges. I mean, he was found guilty of the charges, but he was allowed to be uh, deemed insane because back then it was really hard to get an insanity plea. You know, the, the whole mental illness thing wasn't like it is now. It was like, oh, we are insane. You know, you had the Jekyll Hyde thing back then where you had two personalities, but when they saw what he had done, I think, you know, really just laid it out. And yeah, but he died in 1984. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's let's step back a little bit. Now, uh, because he had been in, uh, institutionalized for 30 days, they could not put him on trial for first-degree murder. So what happened after, I don't know, seven or ten years, he was in the mental, mental institution, and they declared that he was competent enough to stand trial. So from what I read they could only convict him of one murder and that was the um, that was Bernice and and because of money uh, they couldn't put him on trial again for the second murder of uh, Mary Hogan Mary Hogan Yeah, something like that. what I read. They loved him. They loved talking with him. The psychiatrist, the other patients, he was absolutely, they loved him. Now, um, he died. When did he die now? Oh, here, I have a picture. Okay, so what happened is when they, when they arrested him, somebody set his house on fire because it was a mysterious fire. the place on fire yeah right. and uh, that house no longer stands and I have uh, the area now where his house once stood now did you know that um, they had one of the newspapers went up for auction and they got four hundred dollars for one of those newspapers wow. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so he died in uh, 1984 yeah um, and how did he die? Uh, it was congestive heart failure. Right. Right. And so because of Ed Gein, um, three other movies were kind of modeled after him. What were those three movies? Actually, there was, there was quite a few, but the ones that are the biggest ones were Psycho, uh, Silence of the Lambs, and Contrary to Blues, I've heard a lot of people say that uh, Hannibal Lecter was based on it. You know, it was actually Buffalo Bill who wore the skins of the ladies. Uh, so Psycho, that, there was one called The Range, which is probably the closest film I've seen to the actual ending story. And then, of course, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Right, right. Well, uh, Jason, um, do you want to give people your website where they can find you? And, and uh, Jason is a, uh, you're, you're part of um, Dark Corners Productions. And you're also making a movie, is that correct? We are, we're making quite a few, but uh, the one I think everybody would be interested in is the Texas Chainsaw Maniacs. <laughs> yeah. What's your website, Jason? Uh, DarkestCornersProductions.com um, uh, Do we have a little time where I can discuss some of the TCM factors about uh, Ed? 
Oh sure, go ahead. Let me let me see. Does any any of the viewers have any questions that you'd like to ask J Jason about Ed before uh, Ed uh, Jason continues? Anybody have any questions? Okay, go ahead, um, Jason. Okay. Um, now, of course, we want to take the on massacre. Let me start with one of people had family who lived in Wisconsin. And when he, he was a young little kid when they would come and visit, and they would tell the story of that game. And so that kind of stuck in his mind. And I just want to hit on a few little things, because when people hear about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but then, yeah, he's a guy who wore a mask made up of skin. That's the only correlation that was with that game. But in actuality, the first scene you see in Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the hitchhiker robbing graves and pulling up the bodies. So that was one. Um, that you see. Another one that I, I really think got overlooked by many people is when Leatherface in the, ch the Chainsaw films, he's very effeminate a lot of times. He wears the apron, he puts on female masks, which also is a direct correlation with Edward. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, and of course you have the house and all that with all the, the same props that you know, Robert Burns made for the movie were straight out of Edward's life, you know, you can tell. But of course, the most famous thing that sometimes gets overlooked in the Chainsaw films was when Terry McMahon, also known as Pam in the movie, was hung on the meat hook. Well, that is a direct uh, uh, correlation to Bernice being, you know, hung like a deer, hung yeah. like meat. Yeah. And so there's a lot more in that film that was related to Edward Gein and a lot of people I think really realize until you really pay attention. Uh, I, we do have some questions in the chat. Okay. Um, well, okay, we already discussed this, but um, what was he like as a child growing up? You want to just go over that? Okay, he was very withdrawn. Uh, the only friend he had was his mother, and he hung out with his brother and going fishing and hunting. But yeah, he, he was really quiet, shy, good grades, uh, but bullied to no end. Um, is there any is there any history about that? Um, Actually, I read that there's not much said about him anymore. That most of that's been got lost. Yeah, there's not a whole lot. You know, there there'll be one or two sentences about his childhood, uh, but it all from probably up until his fifties when all this really happened. Uh, there's really very little that was known about, aside from that kind of thing that really happened with him. You know, we don't know if he abused animals like so many serial killers have been known. You know, they start with animals and kind of build up. There's no, you know, record of that or anything of that nature. Um, also, another question, how much was the movie similar to, re to real life? Uh, which movie? I, I imagine they're talking about uh, the Texas. Texas yeah. Um, once again, you know, there's, there's certain things. There's the cannibalism. Um, really, if you think about the the film, Ed Gein is actually Leatherface and the cook, uh, played by Jim Seadow, because Jim Seadow was Ed Gein when he went to town. You know, in the film, he ran a little barbecue shop, and everybody in the town supposedly liked him until he gets back. He's like, I'll have no part of killing, and then Leatherface would do the killing. So both those characters were really the two personalities of any Ed. Um, but all in all, aside from the few little minor things I've, I've talked about, there, you know, it wasn't in Texas. He never, you know, necessarily used a chainsaw. We don't know what he used to, to dress up or any sort of his body like he did. I guess he could have used a chainsaw, but more likely it was a butt knife or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the chainsaw itself, you've really got to just understand that the house and, and the mask were the main things taken from it in. Um, now, let's see. Uh, some, uh, what made his mother so crazy? Well, <laughs> if you read, it talks about her being a loose friend. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that religion did it to her, but she was a religious zealot. Uh, you know, religion has its place, and I have no problem with that, but when she took it to an extreme level, and I'm sure, you know, having an abusive drunk husband didn't help that fact either. Right. And so mixed with that, and, and but the main thing that when Augusta was talked to about, it was always just her, her religious beliefs that she took, to a 
through to see if there's any other questions. Yeah, they said Ed didn't have a chance. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess that's that's it. Well, Jason, thank you so much for um, being my guest on the show tonight. It was a pleasure to have you and all the information that you shared with the viewers about Ed Gein. Um, very informative. Uh, I appreciate well, thank it. Thank you very much. And thank you, and, and, and good luck to you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you so much, and thanks so much for being still in chat. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Again, um, the show's live on Thursdays. And uh, next show, uh, next Thursday, will be Who is the Real Jack the Ripper? So I hope you join us next week at the same time, uh, livesci-fi.tv. Don't forget to leave comments, give us a like, and any um, comments as well that uh, you'd like us, uh, what kind of shows you'd like uh, to present to you. So everybody, I'm going to say good night and thank you so much. And hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being with us. I, I really appreciate it. Good night, everyone. Thank you.